This podcast is brought to you by the Deluxe Edition Network. To find more great shows on our network, head over to the den.show. So that's the crew of the Memphis Bell, huh? Those are the enlisted men. You're meeting the officers this afternoon. <laughs> they must be the 10 luckiest sons of bitches in the world. They're just ordinary men, Colonel. Are you kidding? Ordinary. First they volunteer for all this, and then they fly 24 missions without a scratch. Say, what do you guys know about Germany? Pretty women? Good beer. The hamburger's named after a town there. Uh-huh. A little bird tells me that's where they're sending us tomorrow. Are you sure? Uh, we ain't going to Crowdville. Our plane's broke. No, it's fixed. <clears throat> Christ, let's go break it. Wait a minute, they wouldn't send us to Germany our last well, time. They're going to milk run to France. I can see it. I get back home, I'm doing it to the wife, the door breaks open, and there's Danny taking a picture. Good morning. Morning, Lieutenant. What, you drunk? Why, are you? Are you kidding? We got a mission. I know, that's why. See, I'm gonna get it today. My number's up. My luck's run out. And I'm gonna die, so I wanna give you something to remember me by. You gotta get a hold of yourself, Junior. I don't want your watch. Everybody's counting on you. Them guys didn't even have time to pee in their pants. Here one minute, go on the next. If you gotta go, that's the way. Listen, we have to talk about it. Bandits, five o'clock. destroyed my favorite harmonica. Oh, you run, son of a bitches! And your mother, too! What was that? There's a hole as big as my dick in the left wing. What are the doing? Big bombs away! Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to BAF. This is my pick for the War is Hell series, Memphis Bell. And in our show, we have Chase, Lenny, Stu, Ragnar, and myself. Now, Memphis Bell is a favorite of mine when I was a kid. I've seen this movie so many times. It was a constant request as a video rental. Um, the movie is directed by Michael Caton Jones. And th- this is interesting because his movies that he's done, I'm sure you guys have seen most of these. He's done Rob Roy, Doc Hollywood, the Jackal, City by the Sea, Basic Instinct 2, and This Boy's Life, the one with De Niro and uh, Caprio. I'm sure you guys have seen that one. Which one? Uh, this Boy's Life about the abuse, the uh, um, Robert De Niro being an abusive stepfather. I don't think I saw that one. Stu, I know you've seen that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure everybody's seen Doc Hollywood with uh, Michael J. Fox. That was a good movie. Yeah, no, this this movie's got a great cast. I, I mean, a lot of classic act. I mean, classic actors that I probably everybody knows. Uh, the cast includes Matthew Modine, DB Sweeney, Eric Stoltz. That's just a cool name. Oh, DB Sweeney. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's just a cool name. Fucking uh, cutting edge. <laughs> uh, Sean Astin, Billy Zane, Tate Donovan, Henry Connick Jr., Neil Gutulani, Courtney Gaines, David Strathorn, and John Lithgow. Real real quick, I could not fucking figure out DB Sweeney for the life of me in this movie. Why? I I knew where he was from. I couldn't fucking picture where he was from. He's not in that many movies. He's He's not. But I know him from the cutting edge. Yeah, that's the only thing I I know him from. Fucking put the two to two, the two and two together. Yeah, for it, it was killing me. And about half, maybe three quarters of the way through it. Freaking Snow looked over and told me, he was like, yeah, it's a guy from Cutting Edge. It's like, fuck, I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> and Henry Connick Jr., did you guys knew that was Henry Connick right from the beginning? Yeah, I mean, yeah like, he yeah. looks the same then that he does now. Yeah, yeah. He's, he never stopped, or he never aged, aged. Uh, period. It was, what, what, was that, what, what was that What was that thing about Moby. John Lithgow that you were going to okay. say, you told me earlier? Yeah, so it, it kind of creeped me out. So in the opening scene, I didn't know John Lithgow was in this film um, before I started watching it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the opening scene where they're going through and panning over all the guys and you have John Lithgow doing a voiceover, you know, describing all the guys and especially a lot of his cadence and the way he talked. He sounded identical to me um, with the actor Jay 
Baruchel. I don't, I don't know how to fucking pronounce his last name. Um, but the most people would know him as the voice of the main character from the How to Train Dragon series, which I've never watched. So. Uh, yeah, that's weird. Really? I, I don't watch animated movies that much. What the fuck? I, I'm that's just funny. not into animated movies all that much. Yeah, he doesn't like spending time with his kids. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. Oh, fuck. Um, no, I, I introduced them to better movies than that bullshit. I'm yeah, sorry. You know, that's a good you, movie. You, the uh, inappropriate rated yeah. R ones, those ones, yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> my, now my daughter's watched Aliens for the first time. I loved it. And you, she hasn't had nightmares yet. You that's might know so him then as the, um, uh, uh, the thin white kid from uh, Tropic Thunder. Oh! With, yeah. the, with the glasses? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So... Imagine his voice now, and you, I can see that. Yeah, Dude, that's it is a, weird how much they sound that's, like. That's a movie we got to cover sometime. Yeah, yes. like, uh, yes. that's <laughs> cool. uh, uh, Tropic Thunder. That's one of my picks. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna point out as far as like while we're talking about the cast, real quick, couple things. One, uh, Billy Zane has hair in this movie. What the fuck? Like right? that, well, he had hair in most of the movies in the yeah. early nineties. No, I mean he, he, he didn't set. go bald until. Uh, um, uh, I only fucking remember Demon him Knight. being yeah. Demon Knight. Yeah, I remember. I've only. I've only really well. I've I've only I mostly remember movies where he's he's been bald except for like I think on the Titanic he had hair yeah but yeah. otherwise like, that was a wig time, you could tell that was a fucking wig yeah every time I've seen him he's he's been bald so yeah. that was weird and then the other thing was um, that I wanted to comment on two things one was similar to what you were saying one of the, one of the reasons why I like watching old movies I've never seen before is because sometimes I'll be like like star studded yeah but it's not necessarily star studded for its time because a lot of these guys are still pretty new to the movie scene yeah but then you you watch it from your perspective now and you're like oh shit that's so and so yep. oh fuck that's so and so oh this is cool yeah. kind of like um the movie the outsiders yes. oh yeah I mean, dude good movie but back then a lot of those guys they they weren't really you know when that movie came out they not even had tom cruise in it yeah they they weren't huge yet yeah so and but then you go back and you watch that movie and you're like holy shit there's a lot of really big stars in is now so but the last thing i want to say is that harry connick jr um interesting fact as far as like with me and and, and that guy i did one i didn't know he was a singer i didn't know any of that shit really? the first time i ever saw him or, or knew who he was was in the movie copycat where he played that <laughs> fucking psychotic oh serial god. killer that oh like god. tormented yeah. sigourney weaver's character yeah and I was like, oh, my God. And then, like, <laughs> I saw him in a different movie, and he's, like, singing, and he's all, like, you know, smooth and nice and stuff. And it was just weird as fuck because he did such an amazing job playing this perverted, sick fucking person that yeah. I, I, I didn't even recognize him. So I thought it was really cool. And then getting to hear him sing the dude. Yeah. He's like the he, he's like the original Michael Bublé. He's fucking yeah. good. His he's rendition. He's fucking great. He's a crooner. Yeah. yeah he's really a crooner, is. isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, he, fantastic. So I remember... Uh, Harry Connick Jr., you know, as a singer first, they, they, they tried to make him into a movie star. They really did. There was a big push in the, the early 90s to try to make him into this big multi-threat, you know, movie star. Yeah, I think he was even in Independence Day. Yeah. Will Smith's uh, yep. co uh, um, uh, co-pilot. Yeah, yeah, co yeah, his friend. Yeah. yeah, he was in a lot of shit, you know, in, in that time period, TV shows and stuff like that. And I just never understood why they tried to. I, I I don't think he's a good actor. Yes, he he, he did he did fine he's for. He's decent. I think he, he did fine okay. in this for what he did. I mean, he's a tail gunner. That's all he was. But except for Copycat, he plays almost the same character in every film that he does, and not in a good, memorable way. Yeah, it's just like okay, that's Harry Connick Jr. being Harry Connick Jr. Who. Because they almost always get him to sing because yeah. he's a great singer. Yeah, absolutely. I won't take that away from him. Yeah. Great singer, but they always get him to sing and ev on damn near every fucking thing that he's in. I'm just like, okay, this is, all right, this, this is fucking Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> right. God damn it. Well, that that's, like I said, the, the cast is huge in this. Like one, one of the ones that really stands out to me is fucking uh, Sean Astin as Rascal. I seriously thought, you know, as, as John Lithgow would say in the beginning, that he's the ladies' man, as he said. But you, you could tell that he really he wasn't. He, and he, he was, was so thin. Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was an old chubby. Well, I mean, I think this was only like <laughs> off guard. four or five years after Goonies. I mean, you know, when he was Mikey in the Goonies and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Um, but let's go ahead and get into our drink that we're going to be drinking. Uh, all the shows that we've been doing lately uh, for our War is Hell series has been liquors. So we're actually ending with a, uh, a beer, and which I'm really looking forward to trying because I've never had this. I was just scrolling through the uh, store, and I saw this. I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is perfect. So this is Honor Brewing Company. Uh, cherry wheat located and they, they are located in Chantilly, Virginia, made with pride, search with respect, and shared in tribute. So, this is a Belgian style American wheat beer that is nice. brewed to be crisp, refreshing, and drinkable, brewed with pilsner and wheat malts, American yeast, and one pound gallon of fresh tart and sweet cherry puree. Yeast. 
I see. What I say? I say yeast. Yeah. No. No. It's just that. Oh, it is very yeast. No, I'm laughing because fucking Stu showed me something, and it had yeast. It had something to do with yeast. So that's yeah. all I'm fucking thinking of now. But be- before, luckily, you don't have a gluten allergy. <laughs> I know, thank God. <laughs> that right. suck. Before we drink this, uh, there is a uh, thing that the uh, makers made uh, that will actually work right before we drink this. And it says, our mission is to honor all those who have served and to make great beer. We are dedicated to ensuring those men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice and never will be forgotten. Every beer is a celebration of the soldiers, and we are honored to continue to tell their stories. Let's raise a glass and cheers to freedom and those who create and proudly served our country. So, you guys ready to try this out? Yes, sir. Sounds yep. good. Got your glasses in front of you? Pouring our drinks. It's Actually, not as, that's not, it's as, not as dark as I thought I, it would I was be. expecting it to be like, like, a reddish, like a reddish color. Yeah. But. Well, as soon as they said crisp, I was like, okay, it's going to be a lighter, lighter beer. It's got a nice head right there. Perfect. Wow. All right, guys. Cheers. Yeah. Roast. Uh, Cool. Nothing like a beer yeah. at nothing like a beer at like seven thirty in the morning. Yeah, man, so as Ragnar would say, great start in the morning. Damn right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's crisp. Oh wow, it's not bad. No, yeah, no, not it's bad. not bad at all. Actually, this is really, I okay. It's very. This yeah. is to me. This is a very easy beer to drink. It's something that is. It's not like really heavy. It's, That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, it's light and crisp. Yeah. And do you guys do you note the cherry? I mean, do you oh, yeah. note that at all? Because I, you can tell like the tartness in it. There's a little tartness in the beer. It's almost a uh, little bit of a cidery ish. Yeah, no, I, I'm good. Good, yeah, good uh, yeah. description on that. Would you really? Yeah, no, I can get to that. Yeah, yeah. like a cherry cider type of thing. Almost, yeah, something like that. It's not not like a, no, a, I a drink full it. fucking like cider, like a whole cider would be, but like the crispness of it and the the cherry flavor. <clears throat> yeah, you know what? Cider. I can see that. I'm not even a big cider fan, but I still, it's like half cider, half beer. Almost, yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to have to give that a thumb and a half. I'll give that a thumb and a half uh, for this beer. Um, it, it's good. It's something that I would buy again, but it's not like my ultimate like go-to, but I, it's not a bad beer. I think Honor Brewing Company did a good job with it. They knocked it out of the park, but um, yeah, but Thumb and a half. How about you, uh, Ragnar? I give a thumb and a thumb and a half for a, yeah, it's a good morning beer. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> We're starting the day off. Nothing right. like cherries in the morning. Nope. Gotta love it. Oh, um, yeah. It's light. It's crisp. It's tasty. Like I said, it t- it's almost like a fucking cider e ish. And that that's why I went down because when you brought up cider, then I was like, ah, oh, you're right. It does have like a cider taste. So yeah. that's why I went down because I I can't stand ciders like fucking Lenny here drinking his pumpkin shit. But um, you shut your mouth. <laughs> pumpkin spice is amazing. <laughs> but uh, uh, basic bitch. That's right. <laughs> where where are my Uggs at? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good. It's good for what it is. You know, I think they did a good job with this. Yeah. How about you, uh, Stu? Um, it's not my personal preference. Uh, it's not bad. I'm probably gonna have to give it maybe a one at most. Um, it's not something I will buy. I understand why people would enjoy it. You know, they have the other ones that this company makes are good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it for what they were going for for the flavor profile they're going for, they nailed it. They yeah. absolutely did. I understand. You know, people would enjoy it. Like you said, it's on your description of a cidery taste. The lightness, the crispness, it's all there. But honestly, your your, your statement that it's it's a good morning beer, that works fucking amazing. No, no, I, I think <laughs> actually th- this is a good beer to drink. Because yeah. we, we're like everybody knows, we're recording this very early in the morning because we just recorded one last night that lasted fucking forever. A couple hours ago. <laughs> yeah. Technically, yeah, you're, you're right. So, um, and then one of the... Uh, one of the hosts got attacked by a trash panda. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. We have to tell that story. So, <laughs> you know what? Let's just go ahead and say it real quick. Last night, we were all doing our recording. I think we were done at like 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. Everybody was getting in their cars to leave, and I'm in bed, and then I'm getting texts. A fucking raccoon got in my car. <laughs> yeah, I saw and that. It, that was his yeah. only catch for a while. Yeah, like, I, I, yeah, like, did to the point where Stu he said, "You need to go check at the top of the hill, make sure he's all right." Because I, I, I didn't know if the raccoon was still in there or not. And then he sent pictures. <laughs> he fucking ate my Chick Fil A. <laughs> Dude, I totally like pictured like <laughs> him shining a flashlight in his car, and all of a sudden it just comes into view. <laughs> <laughs> <And> he's like. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, oh, that's awesome. That would have been dude. awesome. Oh. Yeah. But also, who would shine a flashlight in their car? <laughs> it could be what they would get. Dude, you know, they'd be opening the door, also, the raccoon just like, tad jumps out and hits your face. So, we apparently only had like his window <laughs> open, like hilarious. hands, like his window was open, like hands length, yeah. but it, it got inside. And we have a raccoon here because every morning we're waking up on our vehicles with paw prints all over our cars, walking all Once over. Once again, I'm, I, like I said in the, in the text chat, I. We still actually haven't heard from Spicy Boner. We only saw text. I'm pretty sure from that the Spicy right Boner. From who? You're right. You're right. <laughs> oh, You're man. Right. You're absolutely right. Oh, oh shit. Snap. You're right. Uh, Get ready for the fucking hiccups. hiccups. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. I almost never have fucking Spicy Boner. <laughs> God damn it. Nope. So we got to do more recording to the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm, hey, I'm happy on my episode. You get one. You haven't seen him try this shit, too, which you got to try it out also. So, What is that stuff? This is a homebrew from uh, Ragnar here. Oh, it's the spicy stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to try like a sip of it. I'll just uh-huh. try it. I'll tell you what. I'm going to shoot his. Oh, yeah. Okay, before we do that, uh, this is a little bonus that we're having in the show right here. Lenny needs to try out uh, what we did in our last show, the uh, homebrew that uh, Stu came up with to try and fuck me, but it didn't. Uh-huh. So now he, we're going to have Lenny try because rumble, technically rumble, rumble. our rule is that if you make something, all of us have to try it and see if we hate it. So Lenny, why don't you go ahead and try yours first? Okay. This is the homebrew that uh, Harley and Stu made. Dude, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> that no, does, does it really taste like good? Does it taste like a mouthful of Skittles? It does, dude. That's really good, man. No, I'm sorry. He's like super disappointed. He was disappointed at the the other show. Bro, I would buy this. Epic fucking fail, man. I would buy this. This was really good. Wow. Tell them the uh, the ingredients that are in there. All right. um, So the base liquors, it's one half El Toro tequila, um, silver. Okay. So super cheap, you know, $11 for a fucking $750. Um, Super cheap tequila. It even has a little sombrero on it. Uh, then that's for uh, authenticity. One yeah. quarter watermelon shine, one quarter Everclear, like the the real Everclear, the the one ninety proof. Yeah, that was, um, that was really good. And then a fuck ton of different watermelon candies, um, all melted down and mixed into basically a, a, a really thick, simple syrup. You know, so poured in. it was it was it definitely had like a like a syrupy sort of quality to it. It didn't smell good though, did it? It didn't know uh, you don't. I didn't exactly. smell the the candy part at all. I just smelled like like it smelled like rubbing alcohol, like like vodka or something. And then like, but I shot it, and then I got all I got was like sweet. Yep. I was like, oh, that's that's not bad. But okay, gra- I don't mind sweet stuff. Yeah, this is the one that, that doesn't. That's like. what my target was. Yeah, and he failed. Yeah, but yeah, I no, could I see. Get- I could see where you were going with it. It was a, definitely a good attempt trying to get this guy with that. But yeah. I. I, yeah, it, did, it was actually pretty good. All right, so now we are going to have Stu's little punishment shot here, yep. which I'm so proud. I'm so happy right now. This, this, uh, this, you haven't seen this. This this is a reaction from him. This he actually it, reacts to this it, one. It, all right, let's see if it does it this time. That's so far two out of two times it has. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice seeing you actually regret well, not wanting to ch- take it like a champ. Awkward silence. Where is it at? Did Here. you swallow? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just... Wait for the hiccups, but yeah, so are we. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> then he drinks his beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Oh, <coughs> thank you, Stu. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, uh, 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 Lenny, you want to go ahead and give a, a swig of that real quick since you've never tried it? And take a sip of it. Hold on, I need to finish my damn thought. If I had to take a punishment shot for it, I'm getting my goddamn thought out. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Once again, we haven't heard from Chase. Uh, actually physically there talk to him. Uh, so my theory is still the raccoon has killed Chase and stolen his identity. That's my theory <laughs> right now. And he, he, until we actually physically see him, Chase is dead in your ditch right now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's so early in the morning. Um, it's it's good. So I, I'd give it a, a, a carpenter's thumb and a half. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, over the, they're always chopping the finger. Oh, for, the, uh, for his homebrew? No, no, no! For the uh, for, for the beer, the, the beer. We're so, I thought we were talking yeah. about the beer. Well, yeah, let him do the yeah, beer, the beer and then beer take the yeah. shot. I said the the. I was talking about yeah. the. Steve. Oh, okay. So you're doing a review of the beer right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll take a little tiny swig of that in a second. Um, yeah. but I wanted to do the the beer. So, like, okay, whenever I'm wanting to just like knock back a few beers just to kind of feel good and, and kind of just you know whatever, like I'll go for you know things like um, oh I don't know, 
Well, it depends, but it like like beers like the the Becks that we had for the uh, Fury. Yeah. Like throwing a couple of those back or like a, a Corona or whatever. But this beer, it kind of reminds me of one of those beers that like after a meal, you'd want to sit and enjoy yeah. and like take your time and sip on it and just really like enjoy it. Yeah. It's not one of those beers that you want to slam or you want to drink a ton of, but it, it, I definitely like, I get the, I get the, from the flavors and everything else. It's definitely a beer you want to like take in nice and slow and enjoy. Uh, so it's I, I I yeah thumb thumb and a half it's it's actually really really pleasant so I like it a lot. Stu, what was yours for your thumbs? One. It was a one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think we all agree that this is a mediocre beer. It's 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 okay, but it's it's not bad, but it's not like um, amazing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I still feel like Honor Brewing did a very good job. Still. So uh, uh, kudos to uh, Honor Brewing. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and take a uh, swig of that uh, peppery shit right there? See what you think. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> That's, it's like drinking black powder. <laughs> like black, um, black, yeah, pepper. Uh, is it worse? Uh, worse than is? Yeah. Yes. Okay, no, is it worse than... <laughs> oh, I think we might have found one for him. No, it's it's the Malort's worse because the Malort makes me literally, like, gag. That's just, it's like, if you, it reminds me of, like, if you had a glass of, like, a shot of water, like a little bit of water. Yeah. And he put a piss ton of um, black pepper in there. Yeah. Mm. And then just knocked it back. And it just sits on the back of the throat and it's just like, eh. You know, <laughs> it's, it makes it, yeah. yeah. But it's not, I'm not, it, it's uncomfortable, but the Malort is just foul. Yeah. And it's, and it lingers. Like, I'm already pretty much over that. The Malort hangs out for like forever. Like, yeah. Coach yeah. Wait, wait, me and Sue both And you can, and you can like drink and eat other things to try and make it go away. And it's like, nah, yeah, you're going to, you're going to sit and enjoy this. So Stu was enjoying that shit. Our last show that we did, he was just drinking that shit down. Like he was loving it. All right, guys. Well, uh, that is our first segment. So uh, we will be right back. All right, guys, we are back, back to the uh, show for Memphis Bell. Uh, the one thing that I have to uh, point out here is we have to, uh, we had a, um, a fan of our show ask what a spicy boner was. And if you first listened to our shows and uh, or started right in the middle, I'm sure a lot of people are like, what the fuck is that? An excited Spanish guy. Yeah. So, Stu, why don't you explain <laughs> that? <laughs> so, way back when we started this, in the very beginning of the show, um, we all decided to use nicknames instead yeah. of our real names and just because we're all raging idiotic alcoholics we decided that whenever somebody slips up and drops the real name they have to take a, a drink yeah. and uh that was one of the first punishment shots that became a regular situation and it's became uh, it's become our show now that's yeah. basically our show and uh it's become now it's been basically codenamed whenever anybody drops you know a, a real name we have the spicy boner which was uh, a blooper from yes. from uh, uh, Lenny here. There was I was just going through our one of our bloopers when I was doing editing our show. I was like that fucking is hilarious. Yeah. It was like I, I'm going to use that. Well, so okay, so poor Ron here, the the producer, he likes to say, "Okay, you guys, here we go. One, two, and this little count." And then he'll go to start talking, and one of us will inevitably moan or say some dumb shit. And one day at that, I, that I just, have hundreds of them. Yeah, yeah hundreds that, of them. One day that just popped in my head. I was like, "Spicy powder!" And ever since then, he was like, "Dude, I'm using that." And I was like, "Yeah, sure." Like, it just, <laughs> I don't know. It just popped in my head because it was like an off the wall, hilarious thing to say. And well, the fan did ask, "What is a spicy boner?" So, what is your definition of a spicy boner? That, that's, a, that's a boner that the ladies can't resist. <laughs> <laughs> to me, in salsa. it's when you are <laughs> dipping your your fun parts in this quality quality punishment shot that you guys have made for me. Yeah. Oh <laughs> God. Oh yeah. So it burns. <sighs> but yeah, there's your definition of the spicy boner. So now let's get back into the movie. So Memphis Bell uh, is based on the last mission of the Memphis Bell, the first B seventeen bomber to complete twenty five missions without losses, but. Of course, this movie has been made for a dramatic effect. So it's fictional based on loosely fact. It's all incidents that are based on the B-17 missions in general, like all the B-17s during the time over the reign over Europe. In fact, I have to bring this critical review from a critic that I found. Despite its good intentions to highlight the risks and heroics of brave men who flew dangerous bombing missions deep into enemy soil during World War II, the one thing which you can't miss about Memphis Bell is that it is a cliche commercial production. And, in a, and I think we can all agree it is. 100%. But... I still love this movie, and the one thing 
that I love about this movie is it talks about brotherhood and teamwork, you know, mm -hmm. up in the skies. I, I kind of relate this almost to the uh, one of our last uh, episodes of Fury because Fury was in a tank, although that one's a very well done, well made movie, made more modern of World War II. This one is typical 90s movie. So it, it's one of those where they just get a whole bunch of huge stars in it and try and make a good movie out of it. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, like I said, we'll get that into our pint reviews, but the, the, the movie characters in this, I mean, the characters in this movie are fictional. They are a compromise of the original characters. So there's, there's no, there's a no comparison. So they, they basically just did not go with that. They didn't use the real names and everything else. They made a fictional crew. Uh, there's so many characters to go down. So I'm actually going to do a round table on your favorite characters. And the characters that we have in the uh, movie are Captain Dennis, uh, Luke, who's the co-pilot, uh, Phil, Valentine, Danny, Verge, Rascal, or Verge or Virgil, uh, Genie. The Virgin. Yes. Well, no, not anymore. <laughs> I, know, I know, but yeah, that was a nickname. Genie, Jack, and Clay. So uh, I'm going to do a round table starting you, Ragnar. Well, who was the uh, character that you really loved or probably would relate to? Uh, oh, man. I would probably say uh, Jack. I, I, yeah. I, I think this is going to be everybody's favorite. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I think, yeah, definitely. I believe him. And he, he's not a well known actor. The only no, movie I've seen him in is Shawshank the, Redemption. He's yeah, one of the prisoners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's the only other movie I've seen him in, but he played a great temper. He, he did. A, he did. And it's, it's funny. You see. Like, he's in one of the scenes that you see him doing is when he's trying to do magic tricks. Yeah. You know, with, with a, a quarter. It was, it was a coin. Yeah. That he was doing. And, um, and then that, um, that actually plays out in the actual, uh, plane itself when, uh, Courtney Gaines' character, uh, Eugene, um, thought he lost his, uh, Genie. Yeah. Yeah. He thought he lost his, uh, his fucking necklace and he, he found it. And because he, he pretended to throw it out of the fucking plane and he freaked out all because uh, friggin he had a he put a sign on the back on the back of him. I said, what uh, was it say, don't shoot me or some shit like that. No, I think it said um, <clears throat> did not get laid or something like that. Yeah, last it, night. Was, yeah. it was something. It was something. Yeah, it was weird. ridiculous. Yeah. Well, and it yeah. fucked him up when uh, the sign flew off and it fucked up his shot. So he, he got so fucking pissed over that. It was funny. As shit. Oh, yeah. How about you, Stu? Jack. I, mean, <laughs> I knew it. Uh, I, I just how angry he got, and when he, especially when you can tell a lot of it is him just trying to maintain professionalism yeah. and order in the group. You know the part yeah. when the, you know, especially in the part when they're in the uh, bunker, yeah, and they're all uh, talking to each other. Y'all better settle down, like he's, or shut the. I don't remember what he yeah. said, but he like just screamed at everybody. Like he's just a hot tempered guy. Yeah, just played that well, but he always had good intentions behind his anger. Yeah, um, and honestly. I know it was a sweet redeeming moment to show that he he palmed the yeah. uh, the, the necklace. To me, it didn't need to be there. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it would have worked better. Him actually just fucking throwing that yeah. same Christmas metal metal out fucking you know plane. And so, like, I was like, yep, that fucking fits the goddamn character. <laughs> yeah, <that's> <laughs> Angry little fuck. But <laughs> you, you could tell that both of them kind of were almost like very. That you could tell that they were like brothers. Yeah, you know, just like, all like, of them were. Yeah, well, true, but the thing is, those, I felt like everybody there was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel like everybody had like almost like Valentine and. Uh, uh, Sweeney's character uh, in the bombing section yep. the, uh, in the front of the plane but then you got those two right there on the uh, side turrets and I thought that was really cool because you could tell that they play off of each other really well and yep. one's like more of like a weakling and more of like you know really into luck and stuff like that and then you got Jack who's just fucking hot tempered as fuck so um, how about you uh, Lenny how about you honestly um, Jack was he was he was funny just being so angry and everything else but I I'm a huge Billy Zane fan, so like oh, Valentine, I, I like Valentine because he was very like he was one of the more like well-rounded guys on the plane. Um, he had and and you know the fact that he overcome overcame the adversity with the the medical part um, and decided that you no, know, I'm going to do everything I can and I'm not going to try and puss out and and take the easy route. Yeah, um, and ended up working out, which was good. See, um, but until that particular moment he just read slimy as shit to me the uh, every other scene well I'm he like, wasn't what he was i mean because he kept saying that he was a fucker well he kept saying that he was a doctor and he only yeah. had like two weeks, two weeks of weeks medical of school medical or something school. like that uh, but he did he did try to like like the, there was a scene with um who was it uh the staff sergeant who was was convinced that he was gonna fucking die yeah on this mission and he was all pissed drunk and fucked up and it was it was billy zane's character valentine who found him and was like hey you know get your shit together let's go and kind of like well he pukes on him in the fucking bathroom yeah, yeah. and he like and he kind of you know he <laughs> stick sat your there finger down your throat stick your finger down your throat or i'm gonna do it for you and then he just and he, right but he did that and the thing but i i respected that part at least because he 
he could have been like, you know, fuck you, man, just whatever, and just left him. But he, no, no, you know, he got him up on his feet. And he's like, no, you're doing this. You're going to be fine. He, put, and he basically gave him the kick in the ass he needed yeah, um, to get him, get him kind of sobered up and get him on the plane so that they could get this mission done. Because I think D.B. Sweeney's character who played uh, <clears throat> um, Phil, uh, it, it sucked because he just did, he wanted this to be over with. He was ready. And everybody was so excited and, you know, because they were trying to hold, throw a whole – uh, shebang for Memphis Bell, which actually never happened. That was never. I would fucking pray it didn't happen. Yeah, no shit. you are begging for badness. Well, I think uh, I mean, yeah, well, not John to be Lithgow superstitious yeah. or anything yeah. like that. But there's certain things you don't fucking do during wartime. You you don't fucking count your chickens before they fucking hatch. No. It, you are begging for shit to go sideways. Yeah, that's why, like, I think he point. basically fucked them. Well, John yeah, Lithgow yeah, was up there and on the uh, top of the stage when they were doing the whole uh, little party before they do the mission and everything. And as soon as he says Memphis Bell, we go go and everything else and everybody just got quiet yeah because there was like this is bad luck say hip hip and, uh, and uh, even like, to no. this day yeah. you know that you just don't that, do that superstition yeah you know hangs around and I, you know and i will say like i mean being a civilian and, and not being in the military even i can can say like you know i uh, it's 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 and being being very much a christian i'm still i uh, do have some belief in like superstitious stuff like that like you you say the words. What's the famous words that you say like when you're working on a shift? Man, it really is quiet. Yo, yeah, oh, no. And the moment you say that, oh, that's no, what happens. No, 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 no. Shit hits the fan. Yep. Yeah. Right. That's why everyone's like, don't say, the, don't say it, because I, it pound for pound, it fucking happens. Man, it's just a quiet night tonight. Yeah. Boom, and you get fucking nailed. Or you're in a huge rush to get somewhere, and that's when you hit every red light. You hit every slow motherfucker on the road. Yep. Everything that could possibly happen happens. So. Yeah, like when even being even being a civilian, I was able to recognize. I was like, "Oh, what is he doing?" No, yeah. no, 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 no. And I like John Lithgow; he's fucking awesome. I love him in a lot of movies. But at that moment, I was like, "Somebody throw something at that dude! Muzzle him!" Exactly. Stop it! You know? Yeah. Like you're you're literally condemning these dudes to yeah. death right now in front of everyone. Yep. And he had no fucking clue on what he was doing. Yeah, he's putting his foot in his mouth. There's a typical like you know someone who's like of a higher echelon that doesn't. They don't really have that that mindset of like the the men. It's like, not you know. even that. It's just the the field. He was an he was the army PR guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so yeah. yeah. yeah he yeah. was a lieutenant colonel. Absolutely understand that. Um, but it, it'd be like a lieutenant colonel in charge of the band. Yeah. All right, they, they yeah. don't have any He's, real understanding. They're, of they're the disconnected actual from war fighting. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And they 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 wouldn't have that mentality. Um, and it's so fucking weird, but it's also, you kind of need those, they're basically civilians, uh, yeah. you know, that happen to be, you know, in the military, their, their mentality is civilian mentality and you need those in order to like, like he was PR. So he needed to have that mentality to sell it to the civilians. He knew, know what they're looking for. Yeah. And if he didn't have that mentality, then he wouldn't have been effective at his job. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and say my favorite characters. I'm, I got two of them. It's Jack. Jack is one of them uh, all together. And really, I'm, I don't really explain because really all you guys explained it. The temper, you know, he was just, he was actually fun to watch. I enjoyed him on the screen, but I actually liked Rascal. I, believe it or not, he was the young one, the young buck of the uh, crew. And he was all stuck up thinking that he was a ladies man. But you can tell it even during that whole uh, party that they had in the beginning that he really wasn't, especially trying to get that girl to, you know, sleep with him. And he says, Oh, I got him. She's going to, she's going to fall right for me and stuff like that. And you know, that he, he, he didn't but, know what the hell he was doing. Well, and and the he, way he played that ball gun or two and shit like that, you yeah. know, the way he dreaded going in there, that, that read so true because yeah. the ball gunner was fucking, that the, sucks. it was one of the deadliest fucking jobs you could have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're uh, literally hanging out there. Like. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, the like when they w when um uh Dave or whatever the name is uh Matthew Medine's character um uh, De uh Captain Dennis Dennis thank you um when he was you know telling the guys all right you know make sure you got your flak jackets on and of course they didn't at the time yeah, yeah. um or when he was telling everybody got shoots on and uh Rascal was like yeah, I got no room in here <laughs> for the shoots well, put your, it hurts put your safety uh safety strap on he's like right, it hurts so <laughs> fucking do it anyway. Um, and glad he did because he fucking yeah, did. No, it was a great thing that, you know, wonderful that he did, but it, it just come from the military aspect.
we have safety regs yeah. that we regularly fucking ignore. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's those particular moments in the, in how he portrayed it, you know, no, the, you know, none of them are fucking, you know, wearing their flak jackets, what I'm sure was, um, even before they took off, before they entered the flak area, you know, was probably standard operating procedure to wear, yeah. uh, you know, wear the flak. Uh, Actually, but they we, weren't. We have a clip here. Oh, jeez. What's wrong, ball turret? A big piece of Nazi flak just hit my turret. Well, are you okay? I guess. You guess or you are? I am. All right. I hope everybody's wearing their flak jackets. Yeah, no, it's true, and actually, that's something I was going to play later in the show. But I mean, I guess I can say we're going to flak is it, it's it's um uh, anti uh, anti air or uh, uh, it's like shrapnel. Yes, and basically it explodes, and I'll explain later in the show what it what how bad it was to these B seventeens. Before we get into that, um, I'm going to go ahead and play one of my favorite lines. Man, we're delayed. There's cloud cover over the target. They're asking us to stand down until further notice. Danny, tell the others. Hey, fellas, the target's clouded over. We're delayed. Oh, son of a bitch. Love Jack. <laughs> Snafu. Situation, Situation normal. normal. All, All fucked, fucked up. up. I've actually used that a lot being younger. And like, uh, because I've seen this movie when I was younger, I actually have said that so many times. Like, if something happened bad or something is going not not good at all i would say that snafu situation normal all fucked up i actually really enjoyed that line so another thing i want to talk about is the uh the way that these guys you know handle how they talk how they are talking on the uh um the headsets and everything else between each other and uh it's a section where they're discussing on what they're going to do after the war this is a long clip here but i thought i'd put this in here because it really explains how all these guys talk to each other so let's go ahead and listen to this Clay, you sure sang great last night. You should do like we keep saying and after the war, go to Hollywood and get a record contract like Frank Sinatra. Yeah, so we can say we knew you when. Nah, I'm going to get a nice little farm, a nice little life and settle down. Looks like she go to Hollywood, shoot, he can star in the movies. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know what I'm going to do after the war, except not work. Yeah, Luke, why go back to the daily grind of being a lifeguard? Take it easy. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, Virg, if I have one more word about that stupid restaurant. It's not stupid. That's what I love about Rascal. Plan. What are you going to do after the war, Rascal? Come to your restaurant and rob it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that yeah. scene. I'm almost a doctor already. Hey, what kind of doctor <laughs> are you going to be, Val? Rich. What about Phil? What's he going to be after the war? I know. A mortician. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey fellas, think about this. My family has. See, this explains business. Captain Dennis how he's so by the book, and it seems like you they all respect him, but you know that they they're annoyed about how he reacts to them and everything else. But he's just trying to be there for his uh, men. Like I said, don't give it a thought. Yeah, that's just what we need. You ordering us around for the rest of our lives. Let's do the pre-flight check. Yeah, don't hug the unicorn. Call out them fighters. <laughs> check your masks. Let's make us our best <laughs> one yet. <laughs> I'm not that bad. Say, Danny boy, you didn't say what you're going to do when it's all over with. Clay, I don't even like to think about it. I mean, what if something happens? I mean, well, we can all be old men by the time the war is over. It just seems so far away, you know? The thing about Danny, because he's more of like, you know, he's the poet. He's the, uh, you know, when he says that saying, do you guys were, you know, do you understand what he meant by that? About, you know, you never know when the world's going to be, the world war is going to be over. So really, do, do you think it's best to think about what you're going to do after the war? Or do you guys feel like to not think about that at all? Not to think about your future. Hope. Yeah. Yeah. You need you know. to have something to shoot for. Um, yeah. Realistically, otherwise you're going to get lost in, in the moment. And mentality wise it's not good to be hyper focused on what the war is at the moment because that's fucking depressing as yeah. shit it yeah. really is you need to have that light at the end of the tunnel yeah no that's that's one thing i loved about this movie is uh, to me it really shows how these guys are there for each other and it shows teamwork like i said about holding about fury and you can tell that they bust each other's balls i'm constantly like rascal's busting virgil about his lose not losing his virginity when he finally does so he calls him 
Verge, and it, it From fits the chick perfectly. He was trying to score with, mm. yeah, which he scored with, with he scored with, which I thought was funny. I I thought that uh, I, I liked the fact that he kept talking about how he wanted to build a burger place and stuff like that. And Rascal was which was shit. genius, <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the time, if you think about a chain restaurant, you know, in the forties, but nobody would have thought that exist. But nobody would have thought exactly. that. That's the thing. So and wanting that, you know, ability is like, all right, I can go to fucking Kansas City or I can go to fucking Chicago, and I'm I'm getting the same. Qual, you know, same level yeah. of yeah. service, same meals. It's gonna feel the same to me. Which funny about funny about uh, yeah. funny part about that was when he was describing the his burger chain plans yeah. to the girl. He had no fucking clue that like she's taking it as sexual. Yes, you know. Yes, and he's just keep going on and on and on about yeah. yeah he's really his thick. meat. Yeah. Well, he was nervous as fuck. I'm not even going to say she's taking it sexual. I think she's trying to turn it sexual yeah, and trying yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to make it into flirting. Yeah. And he just, like, he's like, oh, yeah, really? Okay. Anyway, so the, <laughs> I want shiny walls. And I'm <laughs> it's like, God damn it, boy. <laughs> and then when she when it, when she catches on that he has no experience, like, yeah. it's like, oh, Oh really? You don't know what you're okay. doing? Okay, let me go ahead and take the lead you. for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Am I doing it wrong? No. You're <laughs> <laughs> so I got one more clip that I'm going to play, and I, like I said, I I just wanted to gather some of these clips, and then we'll get into the history and everything else. But this is another thing that I loved about it. It's another way to pass the time while they're on this plane. Is you know tell jokes to each, tell jokes to each other, yeah. and Rascal tells this fucking great joke. So let's go ahead and listen to this. I heard a good one from the waste gun on Windy City. What was his name? Coy. No, I mean the left one. What am I talking to myself, Coley? I mean the right one. I know the guy. Tall guy? You wasn't so tall. Well, everybody's tall to me. Lindquist. No, no, no. Well, something like that. Verge, you're not even close. Anyway, a plane gets shot down. The guy bails out and the Gestapo gets him. His leg is broken, so they have to amputate. He says, do me a favor. After you cut it off, will you give it to one of your pilots and have him drop it over my base in England? And they do it. Rascal, don't tie up the intercom. Wait, this is a quick one. <laughs> the next week, they cut off his other leg. He says again, we have someone drop it over my base in England. And they do it. The next week, they gotta cut off his arm. He asks him one more time, will you please have someone drop it over my base in England? This time they say, nine, this we can't do anymore. And he says, why not? And they say, we think you're trying to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, son of a gun. I don't get it. That was pretty good, Rascal. I think even Dennis liked that one. Yeah, no, I piece thought that was a piece. Yeah. I thought that was a funny joke right there, but that's why I loved about Rascal because he was like I said, he was a young buck of the crew and I thought that he was really good at what he did, but the fucking the job that he had on the uh, on the B seventeen, I don't know how the fuck you can be stuck in that little fucking ball, claustrophobic as fuck. Because the one thing about that in real reality is that sometimes those things will get jammed to the point where they can't even get out. And sometimes the uh, wheels, the uh, uh, landing gear, will not come down. So if they have to belly land, that guy's getting scraped off on the concrete or wherever yeah. it is. And yeah. I mean, they've lost a lot of people in the ball turrets, and it's just so open because it's right underneath. But claustrophobic as fuck i don't know how he how you can manage that and jam you gotta, you gotta be very very little yeah the scene that there. actually that, that 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 joke that you just played that scene right there spoke spoke volumes to me because that is something when when you would hear about somebody in your unit yeah you know buying you know buying the farm if you weren't super close to that person that's the best way you can honor them is to tell something that was pretty you know funny they did or yeah. something, co- something yeah. cool that they did and stuff like that and it's it's your own little private memorial for that person and to basically you're saying that this person had an impact this person did something because you're also hoping that if, if it's your turn up then you've left some sort of impact on on, on your fellow soldiers yeah uh in, in a positive light mm-hmm. and absolutely so them taking that time to show that yes it was it was a funny joke and so like that but it actually you, you could tell that's what they were all doing they were they were trying to honor a, a, you know a, a fallen soldier yeah and i thought that was really well done no it was it, it it and like i said the writing in this movie i i remember i was talking to Stu about this you didn't say the writing was all that good i'm, I'm sure you'll get that in your pint reviews but it still overall was very entertaining in my opinion. I still thought that it was very entertaining to watch how these guys work and all the, the cast members and stuff like that. So it worked. But uh, other than that, so we're going to go ahead and talk about the movie inaccuracies and in, uh, this um, 
this movie. There, there, there's a lot to go down, but I'm only, I only picked a couple here, and uh, it's, it's weird because this is one deliberate mistake. When the crew are piling into their Jeep to ride out to their aircraft, the gunners ask the officers what their target is and are disgusted to hear that this is Bremen. A tough one. The gunners should know their target already. Gunners were briefed on their target and told what kind of fighter oppos- opposition to expect. So, I mean, you, you can see that's fake right there. And then this is one that I really, uh, because when they're up in the plane, the it's extremely cold. Dennis warns the crew not to go without their oxygen masks throughout the movie. Most of them do. At the surface of altitude of 25,000 feet, any B-17 crew member who went without oxygen for more than one minute would lapse into unconsciousness after 20 minutes, and they would be dead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so... Another thing I wanted to point out is uh, these bombers were flying at a very high altitude. The air of that altitude was extremely cold. In fact, their wounded airmen survived because the exposed wounds would freeze and therefore stop bleeding. Due to the fact that the cabin was not pressurized, the necessitated need for oxygen, bombers' jackets, and gloves, under no circumstances would airmen remove their gloves to touch the metal because their skin would instantly adhere to any exposed metal at the altitude temperature. That makes scene with the disappearing, reappearing metal seem unbelievable. Yeah, because I think at 22,000 feet in an unpressurized cabin, you're at negative 60. Yes, yes, um, I remember reading about that. And it, uh, more modern, you know, after that, you know, at that time they didn't have it. But later years, when they would be at that level in an unpressurized cabin, they were having electrically heated suits yeah, and yeah. everything like that in order to try to keep you know the uh, uh, the the airmen from f- literally freezing. freezing to death yeah um and just to think about being in an unpressurized cabin uh for extended periods of time like they were for hours on end it's just ridiculous yeah it, it's insane another error is uh that when the radio when the radio operator was asking for a radio check he used a phonetic alphabet he used the word tango representing the letter t tango is a modern and current representation for T. In the 1940s, the word was tear, Abel, Baker, Roger, Sugar, tear, Uncle, and Zebra. Mm -hmm. So that was another uh, screw-up that they had. And probably my last one that I'm going to bring up is in Memphis Bell, the bomber force is ordered to circle back to the initial point when the primary target is obscured by smoke and cloud cover. In reality, this would not have happened. First, it's very hard to have a formation of a 300-plus fortress make a 180-degree turn. So that was... uh, some of the inaccuracies that I pointed out in the movie, but uh, let's go ahead and talk about the story of the Memphis Bell. In the summer of 1943, a fierce battle raged in the skies above Europe. Every day, hundreds of young airmen faced death as they flew their bombing raids deep into enemy territory. Fewer and fewer are coming back. That was a prologue in the beginning of the movie, and I thought that really tells you how hard it was. I mean, like I said, I, I don't have a military background. I'm going this from research and everything else. I'm, I'm only the only veterans that we have here are um, Ragnar and Stu. So I did a lot of research and I learned a lot about what happened back then. We in modern times have a much higher surviving rate, um, but in that war, it was you're throwing bodies after bodies after yeah. bodies, um, and that's why it was so brutal. Yeah. I, it was ridiculous. I think they said the uh, um, B-17 crewman had a one in four life expectancy. Yep. It's like uh, one in three or one in four. Yeah. So yeah. Like so when I mean, you think about that, your job is you have a 75% chance of dying and, and dying quick. I think uh, the stat was within two weeks of being a fresh Excellent. recruit, you were, you, most people were dead. Now it, and that it, it's horrible. It's brutal. But that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, given modern times and modern equipment and modern medicine, um, you know, the the success rate for survival now is exponentially more than it obviously would be like back in World War Two, World War One, when then it was like the rules of engagement were there per se, but like it really didn't even fucking matter that much. You know, and yeah. like I said, the the modern medicine and modern times and equipment is a uh, is a key factor into like today's survival rate. Yes, you I know? mean, just think about you know on the news stories when we hear uh, about uh, a Ford operating base being you know attacked and losing something as low as ten soldiers yeah. in one day. It's it's shocking, and major investigations are done. Yeah, just because of ten uh, soldiers. 
but then you were losing hundreds and hundreds a day. Yeah. You know, and I ain't going to say people didn't blink an eye, but that's what the norm was. Yeah. That's what the accepted casualty. And that's why you always yeah. saw um, the uh, the ads yeah. back then, you know, friggin', um, you know, join the Army, join the, you know, Navy, join the Air Force. Because they needed to throw you know, bodies. They needed bodies. Yeah. You know, Uncle Sam wants you. And um, it ju- it goes to show that the amount of people that were needed to actually continue this fucking, um, this war that lasted um, three years. Yeah. It's it's nuts. Yeah, no, it and, is And crazy. you hear, uh, who, I think it was, I, want, I think it was John Lithgow's character who, when they were uh, doing, in the very beginning, mm-hmm. when he was doing the whole fucking interview of all the crew members, you know, and they were telling him that, yeah, when you're done, you come home, you're going to be, uh, you know, going to send you off to Hollywood and you guys are going to be movie stars and shit. Basically, so war bonds. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, mm-hmm. that was, and that, that's actually, that. that's actually the last mission of the Memphis Bell. There's 25 missions, but the 26th mission was a war bond tour, mm-hmm. uh, basically to get these guys home and to represent our country and make it, you know, like we're, we're doing this right and, you know, turn these guys into stars. And I think... I think they even uh, do a section of that in the movie Flags of Our Fathers, too, where they, uh, the two guys go. But, you know, these guys, are war- they, they've been through war, so it's been very hard. I think on one of the uh, characters there, like the other two were like, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, we're getting all the women. But then you have the other character who's just like, "Why? I can't even think about this. You know, I, we have we have brothers that were losing over there. Um, the other thing about the Memphis Bell is that there was a documentary made on the Memphis Bell that is uh, made in the... Um, uh, during the time where a Hollywood director named William Wyler, who won 1943 Oscar for Best Director for Miss Miniver, and uh, also other movies whose name is Jex Bell, Wuthering Heights, wanted a documentary on the B-17 bomber of the daylight strategic bombing over Europe. So they got the uh, a B-17, and they picked one that was climbing up. Uh, his wife took the Oscar on the red carpet while he was flying comet missions over Europe, and one of even one of his cameramen were killed in action on one of the B-17s because they had a camera up there and everything. But he wanted one plane and one crew original, and the plane was called the Invasion 2, and it was on its 16 mission. But it was shot down, and all those men were prisoners of war. So they couldn't do it anymore, but then Memphis Bell was still coming back, coming, going back out and coming back. So they kind of transferred the document to, the, uh, to a different plane and went towards the Memphis Bell to the point where it reached its 25 missions. Sometimes a B-17 makes it home because they are lucky, or sometimes it's because... It's a team of men that never quit looking out for each other. Although such statistics were not circulated among Army Air Force's crew, the average life expectancy of an 8th Air Force B-17 in the late 1943 was 11 missions. When you guys say 1 out of 6 and 1 out of 3, I mean, only 11 missions. That's why Memphis Bell is so remembered. Now, the thing is, out of that whole crew that got to go back home and do war bonds and stay home in safety, but it wasn't really easy for them. To the point where I have uh, journal di- uh, journal entries from uh, one of the uh, the co-pilots, the true uh, co-pilot. Um, these are diary entries I found on a documentary called Memphis Bell, Her Final Mission on YouTube. Uh, these is from Jim Verney, who is the uh, co-pilot. Uh, May 14th, 1943. Boys went out to kill submarine works in Germany. I took a sun bath. 11 bombers lost. May 15th. Boys went to Wil- Wilhelmshaven. I played tennis. Six bombers lost. May 17th, boys went to Lorient. I played tennis and sunbathed. Three bombers lost. May 21st, the boys went to Wilmshaven and took a horrible beating. One group lost four planes, three from my squadron. My buddy Phil Fisher went down on the last raid. The poor devil. God rest his soul. I mean, it's hard. I mean, you're, you're knowing that you're home safe, but then you're knowing that you have your brothers over there losing their lives and you know sacrificing themselves for this war and everything else so what do you all think about that it's it sucks doesn't it it's just but it's also war as hell it's i mean it it, it's brutal (laughs) well it's kind of like um in the movie american sniper with uh, chris kyle like one of the things that they asked him like why he he volunteered and kept going back yeah and it was for that it was that that's one of the reasons is because it's like there are some people that even though they hate it and they don't want to be in it anymore. They will volunteer to go back because they can't stand the thought of being safe at home while they're, list- they're finding out that their brothers and sisters are out there getting killed and they'd rather be by their side if that's going to happen. And 
at least that way they can say they did everything that they could. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you feel like, uh, uh, do you feel that there's been soldiers that have actually, you know, even though they got to go home, they reenlisted and went back? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. For that, for that reason. Yeah. And also, I think one of the things I was going to comment on earlier was like sometimes, um, uh, cause I didn't get to uh, give a comment about this, but yeah, having like a plan for afterwards is a good idea. I think also. In oh, you're talking about when they were talking about what they're going to do for a job. Yeah, because yeah. some guys like when they don't have a plan, um, you'll get some some guys like there was a, the one guy in the group. Uh, I think it was a navigator who basically like they they loved that job and that's all they wanted to do. Yeah, yeah just Eric, keep, Eric Stoltz. Yeah, just character. keep fighting yeah. and keep staying in the military and you know. And I think that's a result of like not really having a plan or anything afterwards. They're like, well, fuck, it, I'm just going to keep doing this. Yeah. Which I mean, if that's what you want to do, I mean, it floats your boat, whatever. If that's fine, but it's not, you know, healthy for any human being to be exposed to that for long, 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 long periods of time, like for over a career. Because after a while, like by the time you get out and you retire, you're a fucking ball of mush, man. You can't function. You know, you have PTSD and all these things going on. It's not healthy for us to be exposed to that environment and for any amount of time you know, yeah basically yeah uh, whether you've done it for one mission or you've one done it for several uh, you know 10 tours or whatever the case yeah. may be you know over your career yeah it's it's not healthy um mentally we most of us have learned to compartmentalize and yeah. you know just our, that's what i had to do um yeah it, it ain't good yeah in any way shape or form and were the ones that they classify as functional basically afterwards versus the ones who weren't able to compartmentalize and, and shove that shit down to a ball of hate. Yeah. Uh, deep down the, the ones that can't do that, are the, the ones that are actually getting the help, uh, in order to get the tools they mentally need. I, I give the respect to everyone who served everyone who supported those who served because well we've talked in other films it's not just the airmen or the soldiers who who suffer through to this it's their well, it's their the families, families, families yeah. that have to deal with this husk that comes back this different person this different individual who they were than when they left and actually, good point that you brought that up, because this is the last clip that I have for the show. Um, it's a little serious here, but it's basically showing these, uh, you know, family members uh, uh, writing to the military about the uh, the men that they lost, their, 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 fa their fathers, their sons, daughters, everybody that they lost. So let's go ahead and listen to that. Dear sir, your letter of December 10th finally made me realize that my husband is gone. I have been living in the false hopes that the telegram I received was a mistake. Dear sir. I am writing on behalf of my parents who appreciated your letter to them about my brother's death. We were all glad to know that Frank didn't suffer and was not alone when he died. I saw him off at the train station when he left to go overseas and he was happy and excited to be doing something important with his life. He couldn't stop looking at the stripes on his shoulder. I hope when this is all over that the world will have learned that there is a better way to solve its problems. My prayers are for my husband's comrades. May they fly safely and return home to their loved ones soon. Best wishes, Mrs. Peter. It's hard. I mean, it it's hard. I mean, because you know, there's there's been many scenes in movies, um, in reality, but the many scenes in movies where you just see the um, uh, what what is it called when they're heading over to your house to to uh, to let you know that you, yeah, and it, like I think that's a beginning scene in Saving Private Ryan. Um, and stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's so hard to lose somebody like that. I mean, instantly quick because your life, it, it's your life is on the line when you're out there, no matter what. And, uh, it's sad, you know, people lost so many family members and, you know, through the war and everything else. So we'll go ahead and talk about the, uh, the Memphis bell real quick. Uh, First of all, the, the last mission, the 25th mission, was the bomber raid against Lorient, a German submarine base. So I don't know if you guys knew what the last mission was, but it's just a simple thing right there. Because, I mean, they, they raided, uh, just like in the movie, they were trying to raid, uh, what were they trying to raid? Like a... Um uh, an air factory, factory yeah, or something like that factory. yeah and they had to make sure that they don't hit civilian schools and so one of the guys says what's the difference they're all nazis and everything else but you know you still how, what do you think of that line and the whole point of that was well actually i was i was going to point out that um when you have that mentality of it doesn't matter like the enemy is the enemy and like you know whether it's a uh, women and children or like the actual soldiers or whatever yeah that was the mentality that like the nazis had um and the fact that they went out of their way to try to to be careful shows that 
we're better than them. We're not going to use the same fucking tactics. Yeah. Um, my grandfather was four years old, uh, living in England um, during uh, Blitzkrieg. Yeah. When basically Germany was like, fuck it, we're just going to bomb the living shit out of everything in England. Fuck them. Civilians doesn't matter. They just started like dropping bombs left and right. Um, my grandfather, he was at home with a babysitter. And he was standing um, kind of by the staircase is what he said he remembers. And then you can hear like the whistling as the bombs are dropping. And um, the babysitter, I guess she, I just instinctively, based off of what she was hearing, it, it was close. So she grabbed my grandfather and immediately like threw them, both them, themselves, he, she hugged him basically and jumped into this closet that was like kind of across from where the stairs were. Cause that was like, you know, the central location yeah. of the apartment. Yeah. And this bomb hit, and it and it ended up hitting their flat. And when they came out of the closet, right where my grandfather was standing, the staircase and everything was gone. Jesus. Had she not grabbed him, I wouldn't be here. So wow. he actually lived through Blitzkrieg, and he said, like, he'll never forget the sound of the of the whistling and everything else. It's still something that haunted him, even at his older age. So yeah, I, I had a lot of respect for the fact that they were so careful, because if you're going to sit there and bomb children and hospitals and everything yeah. else and you're no fucking better than the people you're fighting and then it's like well then what are we doing here yeah, yeah. you know so wow that was an amazing story lenny yeah yeah um aside from on the uh, memphis bell the memphis bell is named after margaret k polk of memphis tennessee although she and robert k morgan who is the uh, uh bob morgan um the pilot of uh, memphis bell broke off their engagement after the returning to the u.s they remained friends for life polk died april 5th 1990 her obituary titled the memphis bell margaret polk dies appeared april 6th 1990 in the memphis bell commercial appeal it runs almost 23 column inches so i thought that was nice. a good fact but we go to the whole names of the B-17s, um, and labeled, there was another nickname for the B-17s, the Flying Fortress, yeah. because they were basically like a fortress in the sky with guns all around and everything else, but they had some uh, interesting names of B-17s, which, uh, let's see here, we got, these are some that I pulled, that I looked at the, that there's hundreds and hundreds of names, but these are some that I pulled here, Nighty Mission, Toggle Tessie, Incendiary Blonde, Shoo 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 Baby, Satan Siren, Pom Pom Express, Bottoms Up, Contrary Mary, Frisky Frisco, Wheezy, Pink Lady, Takeoff Time, Texas Kate, and the Virginia Princess. Out of all the B-17s they had names for the pilot, well, you know, give it, what name would you guys give your Flying Fortress if you were to command a B-17? I'm going to start with you, Ragnar. Scarlet Vixen. Actually, that's a fucking great name. Scarlet Vixen. Yep. All right. How about you? St uh, I'm really curious because you're just giving me this look like it's interesting. No, when I'm glad you asked me this a few days ago, uh, so I got some time to think about it. Yeah. Um, I think the Moira Kali, uh, Moira uh, to honor my Scottish heritage, and then the Kali, the Hindu uh, god. Of yeah, I know. You were talking about Kali. I'm thinking about Temple of Doom right there. Exactly. <laughs> the, the Hindu god of destruction. Yeah. Goddess of destruction. Um, and it just. I, I, for some reason, Moira Kali just sounds <laughs> fucking badass to me. <laughs> it is kind of badass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lenny, how about you? So for mine, I thought about it too, and I wanted to do with something that was feminine but powerful, so I went with Man Eater. Uh -huh. Oh, that's a good uh, one, actually. Go. Yeah. Because it's it it has two meanings. One, it literally destroys men, like eat, gobbles them up um, in the literal sense, in the figurative sense. From a female aspect, like a man eater is like a, a really just – hot woman who just runs through men like she's you know she's kind of hot shit kind of a thing that is awesome so yeah that that was one i went with um i would be devilish vixen um basically because you know there's the dark side i love like women that are really dark and vixen i think vixen is like a fox and and i kind of picked that because of my my wife so i devilish vixen i thought would actually work really well so i really like yours though that that's actually very creative Say that again, Moira Kali. That sounds great. Like, what would you have for like the print on that though? Um, probably uh, like the Hindu goddess Kali, but like with flowing red, fiery hair. That's pretty dead badass. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really curious good. what man yeah. would look like. <laughs> I honestly, yeah, <laughs> like, like a, 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 a very Venus fly trap with bad, <laughs> <laughs> like a very fem feminine looking shark. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. So, uh, Ragnar, what would your print be? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, man. I know. I'm adding to it. <sighs> Asshole. Ah, oh, fuck, man. It'd be uh, curvy fucking redhead chick with uh, 
like a fucking nice corset on riding up on a bomb fuck you oh i like that you know just like in uh um, dr strange love riding on yeah. the bomb um devil's vixen is just be more of like a you know just a, a jagged female wearing just probably all red and with the devil horns but with a little foxtail or something like that you know just make it a little interesting i thought that that that's kind of cool how you get to that's the one thing that's really cool about being a pilot of these things that you get to fly you, you get to name your shit name your uh your b-17 it's just it it's really cool how they do that. And when you say devilish fiction, I automatically think of like some sort of artwork that you'd see on like a Rob Zombie album. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Like you know me well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the history of the B-17s, 12,731 were built. Um, the amount lost was 4,735 were lost during World War II. Damn. That's a third. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fucking crazy. And those things were shot down. Like as we went through those, uh, the journal entries, I mean, every day and you you got to think about it not everybody died the people you know can parachute out and stuff like that but when you think about it each has 10 crew and going back to those journal diaries that i was reading earlier um one day would lose about six planes that's 60 people right there minus a couple people that parachuted out and everything else so uh there was like 10 planes in one day that's over 100 people right there it's just it was death every single day for those b-17s the b-17 was designed by the boeing aircraft company in response to 1934 army air corps specific specification that called for a four engine bomber at a time when two engines were the norm uh the bomber was intended from the outset to attack strategic targets by precision daylight bombing penetrating deep into enemy territory by flying above the effective range of anti anti-aircraft artillery uh typical bomb load is eight thousand pounds for short range and four thousand for long range and uh all the uh, uh b-17s were um equipped with m2 machine gun browning point uh point 50 caliber machine guns it's crazy because the guns are all around the plane top bottom even on the fucking tail, it, it, the tail gunner. I mean, that is another section, just like we were talking about the ball turret earlier. Being in that fucking tail has got to be scary as fuck because you're right there at the end and you know that there's like planes just trying to follow it and would be shooting that thing and everything else. And that thing doesn't have that much of a, uh, uh, what would you say? Um, range. Yeah. Not a range, but more of like a... a yeah, your range of motion. Yeah. Range of motion. Okay, okay. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. But... Uh, and I like the little, like where the crosshairs were and there's like yeah, a, a yeah. mini little tiny barrels so yeah. that they could i yeah. liked that yeah yeah Visualized that was cool that. yeah the uh um the uh b-17 consisted of a pilot a co-pilot a navigator a bombardier nose gunner flight engineer top turret gunner radio operator two waist gunners left and right ball turret gunner and tail gunner um and then i was going to explain about the whole thing about fleck as uh, Stu talked about earlier on Flack was, it was fucking dangerous up there because those things are popping off like everywhere. And the B-17 was extremely thin aluminum. I mean, it, you, you, it would cut through easy. So that scene where Danny gets hit, that would happen. There was holes all around the plane, holes all over the side. You, things are getting cut in half. Uh, you saw that one B-17 get cut in half. That would happen. And the nice thing about this movie is, like I said, it represents what happened to all those B-17s, especially on one. But then you see all those other ones where you see the fucking nose and that guy just falling out. And he didn't have a shoot on when they were saying, you guys need to get your shoots on. Yeah, that was crazy, dude. And then, but also the thing that's just disastrous, I hate hearing, is when that one B-17s get cut in half. And then you hear the radio and says, oh, my God, we're going to die. And you just hear it just fading away as they're just going down. Yeah. It's got to be scary because you think about when that thing gets cut in half, all that air just rushing in. You're trying to exit out that plane but you're being like tumbled all over the place because it's like flipping all over the place it sucks and you're being trapped up in the air like that trying to you know escape the plane but um but what about the uh opening scene when the oh with the, the bomber, landing gear when the bomber lands yes that and, happened and a lot blows up yeah yeah it, it it sucks and there was a lot of miss malfunctions inside the b-17s to the point where that could happen just like we said about the landing gear not working because that actually happened on the memphis bell but that that was just more for dramatic effect but that was a representation of what happened on other planes but the ball turret being stuck because whoever when that thing landed you know that anybody was in that ball turret they're dead i mean they're going to be just scraped off basically so it, it, it's just sad but the the b-17 prototype used some of the same construction techniques of the boeing 247 it was a semi monocoy monocue 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 all aluminum fuselage and the pilot and co-pilot sat side by side 
It was powered by 750 horse Pratt Whitney R16 uh, uh, R1690 Hornets for the uh, the engines. So a lot of the enemy planes that actually fought against the B17s were the ME 109s Messerschwitz. Now, don't get me wrong. This is German, so I can't I mean, if I'm pronouncing these wrong. I'm, yeah. Uh, also, the FW-190s, the Falkwolf, and ME-262s. So um, they they would go through just all the turrets and all around the, the Flying Fortress because they're being shot all over the place. It's it's just a terror in the skies, basically. So the fact that Memphis, Gal, Memphis Bell got up to the 25th, 25th mission is quite amazing. So Especially with them doing daytime raids. But they a, had it, to for yeah. what they were doing. Yeah. I mean, to be at that type of height and to try to put, you know, put ordnance on target. Mm-hmm. You, you need to be able to see what you're yeah, actually going for. Yeah, especially back then, yeah. Yeah. You weren't having the the capabilities that we have now to be able to paint targets and, you know, smart weapons. You're, yep. These are nothing but dumb weapons that you're doing it, so you have to be able to see what the fuck you're doing in order to be effective. Yeah, so... It, that, that's really the other thing about the B-17s is that they were just, they were so easy to cut through and they came down and they've lost so many of them. But the fact that Memphis Bell made it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. And that's why they, like I said, they, they did their 26 mission as the war bond tour. That's basically what their mission was. And to, you know, sh- show America basically to, to sell war bonds, but also to show that, you know, they're fighting for the country and oh, the morale. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's a yeah. morale boost for everybody and, and the civilians and stuff like that. So. All right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and uh, our last segment of this before we get to our pint reviews is I'd like to uh, find out what everybody's seen in the movie that they actually enjoyed that they thought was really well done and everything else. And we're going to start with you, Ragnar. What is your favorite scene so in I this movie? Two. I got two for this one. Go ahead. Um, so the first one is when um, fucking uh, D.B. Sweeney's character, he, um, you know, he, he realizes that, like, you know, he's going to fucking die. He's done on this fucking mission. They're all going to fucking die. So he gets hammered. He gets shit faced. And um, so uh, I can see a lot of soldiers doing that. You know, yeah. a lot of pilots doing that, you know, getting drunk before they're about to go out because, you know, they don't know if it's going to it's going to be their last day. Yeah. So and then uh, um, uh, Billy Zane's character finds him and, you know, he's trying to sober him up and everything like that. And then uh, fast forward. The mission gets postponed, so he goes up on the fucking wing and just takes a nap. Yeah. And I th- I thought it was friggin' hilarious because I've known guys that have done that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who have gotten, like, shit-faced the night before, and they just go hide out, still drunk, trying to sleep it off. And uh, you, know, you find them, they're hammered, still fucking drunk. And you kind of you kind of do everything you can to help them. And uh, so, you know, they don't really get in too much fucking shit for it. Um. And they're just, they're passed the fuck out sleeping. And, and um, fucking Matthew Modine's character, he tells him, yeah, just fucking act like him right now, you know, just relax. Yeah. I was like, you have no, yeah. you have no fucking clue <laughs> why. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, then the other one was uh, in the fucking plane, which um, uh, I think I talked about it earlier, was when um, uh, Jack and uh, Jeannie. Jeannie, they were in the plane and, um, like Genie's looking for his his uh, medallion, and you know Jack basically palms it and to throw it out, and he freaks the fuck out overall because uh, he put a fucking sign on the back of him, you know, and it it totally fucked him up. And I like I like that scene there because, like we were talking earlier about like each character, um, each person had like their their backup, their buddy, their um. Like, they're confidant almost, mm-hmm. you know? And you can see, like, those two relations there where um, they both were, uh, they both fucked with each other the whole time, you know? Oh, they all, they all bust each other's balls. They did, you yeah. know? But, like, you, you form a bond with, you know, a couple people. And, like, that's who you fuck with all the time. Yeah. You know? And, yeah, like, I think uh, Virgin Rascal were kind yeah, of like... Uh, they were the same. Yeah. You know? Um, and I, I love that scene because it's... You know what? Don't fuck with me right now. You know, so are right, you want to fuck with me? All right, well, here, lose your shit. Yeah. You know, and no, here it is the whole fucking time. Yeah, no, no, I completely you know. agree. How about you, Stu? Uh, the scene that stuck out most to me was we the, the we played the clip earlier, but when Lithgow was 
basically shitting all over the commander, um, saying, oh, you don't care about these guys. You know, you're just sending them out to fucking die. You yeah. don't give a fuck about them. And the commander's response, super professional, but also a real big fuck you to Lithgow's character. It's like, no, obviously, I do care about these fucking people. I'm writing individual letters to their fucking families every time, but I'm doing what I have to fucking do. Exactly. Uh, but the, the, the weight on me is fucking insane uh for him to keep all those response letters um and, and th- that just shows you how many letters he actually had to write because you know not every single one of them wrote back yeah. uh to him those were just a small percentage that actually did write back so just how many letters did he have to fucking write and him you know in the letters showing that um how much it meant to those family members who act and he individually knew without you know they talked about how he was able to describe you know the the soldier down to the way he polishes yeah. boots yeah um you know he 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 took it upon himself to build those connections but still have to do a horrible horrible job uh but that's what the job needed um to do and just to, to see that recognition and see Lithgow's expression change as he's as it's sinking in that n- the the brutality I, I keep using that word you know for this in time frame because it was it was it was super fucking brutal but the the, the brutality and the weight that that these people carry on their soul on, on their shoulders in order to perform the job that we're asking them to do um I thought that was a really wonderfully acted scene between two professionals that are are great actors both of them are yeah and they they played it so well it wasn't over the top it wasn't you know you know scene chewing or anything like that they they just did it so well and it was such an important piece of the film and, and i i really and it made appreciate them realize it. yeah that, yeah like how serious this whole thing is yeah it's not just a fucking it's not just a game exactly to, to him yeah the the commander isn't just being an asshole yeah. and following regulations and shit like that no there's a reason for his actions. Well, that actually calls back to another scene with John Lithgow and him in the beginning when the planes are coming down and how he said, you know, the Memphis Bell, they're so special and everything else. And the one thing the other the mm-hmm. other guy says says, all of my men are special. Yeah. You know, and that that's that is true right there. You don't focus on one crew. You focus on everybody. You focus on all the soldiers that are fighting for the country and everything else. And so, that was an excellent commander. That yeah, really absolutely. truly was. And yeah deserved the respect of his men uh because he respected his men as well yes lenny how about you buddy uh for me it would be the the scene where they finally got to drop the bombs because there was so much like tension building up to that scene um and the fact that they're like you know we're gonna make another pass and dude is like that's suicide blah blah and he's like no we're we're gonna this is what we're doing you're gonna have to get over it And they do, and then even with that second pass, it almost looked like it was going to happen at the last second when you see, like, there's a parting in the clouds just enough, and he's like, I see it, we're good, bombs away. I was like, oh, like, it was like that satisfying, kind of like, oh, thank God kind of moment. (laughs) I really enjoyed that a lot. And, like, the whistling with the bombs and everything, and everyone dropping their bombs. And that was real footage right there, too, the bombs uh, hitting down on the uh, ground. That was actually real World War II II footage right there. Nice. Yeah, so that that was definitely my scene. I, I really enjoyed that, and it really showed, like, how incredibly important it can be to be accurate i had no idea yeah you know and so i had a lot more respect for like you know especially back then they didn't have like you know like guided missiles and shit like that like they had to really time their shit and and know know what they're doing and everything had to be perfect in order for them to hit their target so i had a lot of respect for that that's the thing that's crazy is when those bombs are falling i mean they're trying to aim for you, you gotta understand your plane is constantly moving and those things are dropping and they have this uh uh it's something I didn't do the research altogether for, but I, it was questions I asked myself. It's like, you know, this whole little computer system, it was actually a, a early computer system that they had back in World War II to get the exact aiming of where the bomb goes. But you know when those bombs are coming down, they're going to hit other people. They're going to hit other you know civilians or places that they don't want to hit. They, they, there's just no way they can get exactly on point from that high in the sky. If they're professionals, they absolutely I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, well, then there's back then. In the, well, the, now, like I said, I, I don't know. That's no, why I was they, curious. If they're professionals, you absolutely can. That's why you train uh, the people in their specialized field to ensure. But I apologize. Yeah, I, like I said, I didn't know. Well, so. I will say that I, w- I want to say back then they relied a lot more on 
math and science. Yeah, like, yes, yeah. did. there's exact calculations. There's exact like wind velocity. How fast is a plane going? How long does it take? Something weighing as much as that bomb weighs to get to the ground, and all of that ties into exactly when you push that trigger. And that's why you, yeah. uh, the bombardier, you know, when the pilot got them to the point, but then handed control of the craft to the bombardier uh, because it's uh, it, he has to make so many split second ch- uh, changes and decisions yep. yeah you know based on all these different variables and that's why you have that bombardier he was that was his entire training was to be able to calculate when to drop the uh, uh the weapons and the payload uh, on target yeah. and uh they, they, he had a hundred percent control. That was the entire reason was to get this one man to do this one job over this one point. That's yeah. the, every, all that other craft with everybody else on that plane is there to support his mission. Yeah. Uh, and I, I thought he did one. Yeah. I thought I got, I got two scenes here. The one scene is the, actually the clip that we played earlier where they're all talking about what they're going to do when they go home. And you know, the, the interaction between the characters and everything, I thought that was a very entertaining piece showing how these guys, you know, what they're planning on doing. And it, it shows how, you know, they didn't, they had issues with captain Dennis, but he, they still respected him, even though he, he just, he, he was a by the book captain. You can tell that he was just a by the book and do their job. And that other scene that I relate, I mean, love is, when they miss, when they go over and there was cloud cover and they could not drop the bombs, that he was willing to still turn around and say, we have a job to do. We have to get this done. And uh, his co-pilot, Tate Donovan's character, um, basically was like, w- w- why? That, that's, that's suicide and everything else. It, it's just, I thought that was really courageous what he did that we got to get this job done we got it you know there those plane that factory is going to make things that are going to kill our soldiers for world war ii for whatever they're building and everything else so and um, also his concern for like the schools <coughs> and stuff and when the guy's like oh well they're they're all nazis he's like yeah no like no we're not no we're not doing that so. exactly yeah so um so we're going to go ahead and go into our pint reviews so we're going right back to you again ragnar <laughs> you're the first yes. one on the list next man up Oh, man. All right. So, critically, we'll go with a three. Um, It's a 90s movie. Yeah. You know, it's very 90s movie. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, and it's, it it was, it's a fictitious story over actual events. And I think, I, you know, I think it, it. And this was your first time seeing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, because I remember you said you thought you thought scenes. I thought it. I seen it. Yeah, but um, I obviously I didn't. Would you say you're glad that you watched it? Oh, absolutely. I yeah, mean, it's a good movie. Yeah, you know, um, it's it's a good movie for uh for you know the '90s and shit. Um, like I above a three, I I I can't I can't give it anything above a three on it. It's still a good movie though. It really is. I mean, you did a good pick with it. Um, enjoyment, enjoyment. It would be uh. It'd be a three and a half on it. I take that. That's um, fair. You know, it's a it's a fun movie. It's uh, you you get what I like is you get to see the interactions pretty fucking well with each of the characters that they um, that they portrayed. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I thought was very very cheesy was at the very end of it um, when they're cranking down the the, the landing gear. We're not going to die. Stuck. We're not going to die. And it's like a freaking cunt hair from touching down. And then they get the wheel down. You know, I was like, I, I thought that that's was, Hollywood right there. I know. I th- it was very nineties, you know, and it was, I thought that part was just fucking cheesy as hell. Yeah. Um, other than that, you know, it's a good movie. Uh, if you do your research on like that particular time and learn about it, you'll understand a lot more of uh about this movie uh fo- and it's just not just focusing on one crew like uh Lithgow's character did um and basically cursing them for uh their last flight and uh you know if you haven't seen it you should watch it if you like 90s movies so you you would recommend this I'd though recommend for a good it. oh yeah definitely yeah. would yeah. all right Stu, how about you enjoyment i'm probably going to give it a three and a half. um it told the the story it was trying to tell, it was schlocky, of course, uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s time frame. There's things that, you know, I, I, I do not regret seeing this in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, I do suggest people, you know, see it, especially for a more lighthearted war film. Yeah, because they take, a, first of all, this is like PG-13. Yeah. 
it's not as like the the one movies that we did before were a lot more graphic and language and violence. This yeah. one is a little bit less, but it's it's a good representation. Yeah, um, and they did a good job of showing the uh, the family that you create you know with your brothers yeah uh while serving it did a good job showing that the different personalities that and the way they would end fight but also you could tell they they cared about each other yeah uh did a good job of showing that um critically though i i i'm gonna have to say it's a two critically it, it is i was expecting that somebody took a a book how to write a screenplay and followed it fucking beat for beat, for beat. <laughs> it, especially in that time frame there was it, it, it was so cliche throughout the entire fucking film yeah. so predictable how everything's going to go yes there was little shine you know shining moments and stuff like that because of the the wonderful acting chops that a lot of these actors had they they were able to elevate what they were given um and these these a lot of these actors weren't as like big as they were yeah. back then and they've grown more into other movies matthew modi probably not as much but yeah. like you know billy zane yeah and, um uh sean austin of course yeah i think yeah. he he and billy zane are probably the two top two was in there that really rose up yes so. um but it, it was it was bland and mediocre as far as film tell you know storytelling it, it it really was um so yeah i said critically I, it, it's not a good a good representation of a film it, it's not it's just very bland um but i said enjoyment wise three and a half so no that, that I, I find that fair i actually was expecting something lower than that so I'm, I'm happy with that i i can understand your critical view i can completely understand that. that's why my critical view is close to it but that's that's really fair right there how about you lenny um i'm probably right there similar i would say um critically probably about a three um it was uh relatively well done i mean obviously there was there was better well done movies um more movies but it was it was not terrible for its time um as far as entertainment i'd say three and a half um I, I, at no point in time, at least for me, when I was watching the film, was I kind of like, you know, bored or like, you know, like, ugh, like trying to get through these certain scenes. It was all entertaining in its own way. Yeah. It had its funny parts. It had serious parts. It had definitely had suspenseful parts. Um, so, you know, and, uh, kind of touching on what, um, uh, Stu said, and that is that it, it's, it's more of a lighthearted, um, PG-13 version of a war movie. It's not quite as heavy, you know? So if you want to see, like, a war movie that um, is good and it's going to make you feel good and you're going to enjoy and be entertained by, but... You have you a satisfying ending. But you don't necessarily want that heaviness that you get from, like, Fury or Saving Private Ryan, um, then then this would definitely be a good film for you. So uh, overall, that's that's my... I, don't know, I was going to say one other thing. My I forgot to mention during my favorite scenes... One of my other favorite scenes was the uh, was the tomato juice scene. I actually really <laughs> yes. oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. about that. Yeah. That exploding that, that, that surprised me too. That's in our like, title too. So. I was like, oh my god! And then they were and they were like, no, it's tomato soup. You've like, been hit. Uh, no, you're hit. You're in shock. <laughs> yeah. You're in shock. <laughs> that was really good. But anyways, so that that's that's all I got. All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and give my final review. Whoa, 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 whoa. Guys, what, what the fuck? Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> what? What? I I want what? my review in here too. What? Jesus, hold on. You've been sitting here the whole fucking time, <laughs> quiet as shit, like a dick's in your mouth the entire fucking time. Well, y'all wouldn't shut the fuck up. So. Oh my <laughs> fucking god! Oh my god! god no, seriously. Fuck, fuck you, you, Chase. <laughs> all right, give your fucking review. Are you all taking right, a nap? All right, all right. so uh, Memphis Bell overall. Solid fucking movie. Um, uh, for enjoyment, I'm gonna give it uh, three and a half, three point seven five. Okay, pints. Now, I, I I cannot say it is in my top favorite war movies. It just uh, didn't have enough depth to it. But it was good. It was a good represent representation. It was enjoyable. Okay. It, I, you liked the characters for what they presented. You I understand know? why you didn't say this during the middle of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Again, because you guys wouldn't shut the fuck up. Time. Jesus Christ, people. <laughs> Goddamn white people. I swear to God. <laughs> All 
Um, but they're all yeah. white. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, Three point seven five. I can't. I can't not. I cannot give it a, a proper four pints. Um, I'm gonna go and ahead you and. Could. No, you I, could. I, I, yeah. I'm not saying you'd be right, but you could. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> critically. <sighs> Probably the same. Th- three and a half, actually. I'm going to give it three and a half critically. Of course you would. Well, yeah. But as <laughs> I, I will say, I'm really fucking impressed with the cast of it. I, I was not expecting... Because I'd never seen this movie until I watched it. Yeah. Um, obviously. But <laughs> I've never seen this movie until I've seen it. <laughs> until, no fucking so shit. This so was like rah, rah. literally two days ago, all right? So, yeah. um, um uh, but I was really impressed to see the the cast and and all that on this. I was not, I was not expecting to see so many names and faces that I'm so familiar with now, like Harry Cock. <laughs> <laughs> wow! God damn it. Um, Always with the cocks with Stu. Hey, Stu loves you. Cocks. Love the cock. Stu loves cocks. Not like right? you. Um, yeah, you do. Shit, <laughs> boing. No, um, and uh, as far as. Uh, yeah, and three point seven five for the for enjoyment, three point five on uh, critical, and as far as to name my own plane, I'm gonna have to go with a you know a, a classic love of many people like me, big titty goth girl. You said big titty goth girl. I, big you titty, know what? Big titty goth <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You t- tell me you don't fucking like that. You look I'm me in the goddamn eye I'm and tell mad. me you don't. <laughs> not bad, but there is a. And I'm gonna paint Raven on the front on the side. There is a amateur porn star named Big Titty Goth Egg. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Big Titty Goth Girl, I can understand. It, that. it works. It works. I consider myself a connoisseur here, and I've never heard of this, so you must be diving into some serious niche. Oh, I'm deep. I'm deep, hey. Yeah, he's real deep, about three inches. Yeah. I don't think hey, you, you know what? go that deep with him. As long as I scream my name, I don't care how. <laughs> no, um, but yeah, big titty goth girlfriend, and I'm painting Raven on the side of the fucking plane, because you know what? That, you can't be mad at that shit. No. Yeah. <laughs> So, and, and I just uh, want to hear some Germans screaming about seeming a oh, big Diddy Gothko. Big Diddy Gothko <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gothko's coming for us. I love it. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, now that you got, that's strong choice. Now that you choice. guys actually shut the fuck up and let me talk, you know, so. Yeah, if you know, weren't fucking blowing goddamn Hans all the time, <laughs> all right, then maybe we have fucking time for you to fucking speak up. <laughs> Stay you, off you, you must have taken a massive You'll shit be in the bathroom fine. because I didn't see you sitting in your chair. So I, you, I think I gave fucking birth. <laughs> He's been <laughs> under the fucking table for Lenny right now this entire time. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. Hey, hey is that you, why he's you have to support your friends, all right? That's why you're here the every now and then. I knew it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking chase head head in the fucking goddamn. <laughs> So now we can finally get into my fucking review of this movie. I swear to God. (laughs) So I, like I said, I love this movie. It is, this is for enjoyment. It's a four for me. Um, I can watch this a lot. I've seen it so many times that I I remember so many lines that it's, it's, this is a nineties favorite of mine that I used to watch all the time as a kid and growing up. And I still watch to this day. I've seen this many and probably in the last four or five years, I've watched this like three or four times. I've actually really enjoyed this movie. But, of course, it's entertainment. And even though it shows a side of what war was with the B-17s and a more lighter side, it still shows that brotherhood. It still shows that teamwork that they give. And it does a great rep- representation of the other B-17s that through this that went through this this uh, horrible time in our, uh, in our uh, history. But the fact is that I, I enjoy this. I think all the characters are great at what they do. Um, I thought that they were well-made characters. Yeah, I know the writing, so we'll get into my critical here, but... It, it still was a good movie to me, and I would recommend this. And I was actually really excited because I knew Lenny and Ragnar have never seen this movie, just the fact that they've never. So I was really excited to get their input on it and Chase, of course. I've never even heard of it, so yeah. Yeah, so it, like I said, this is a very, I, I guess, would you say this is an underrated film, or do you think this is just like... It's a rated film, I would say. It's not underrated or overrated. I think it's like right in the middle. Well, it's not overrated at all. Like, it's, like I said, I've talked about it, but when I posted the promo, people said, oh, I remember that movie and everything else on our Instagram. So 
it, it, I still would try and recommend this to anybody. Now, my critical would be a three. And I won't go as low as a two and a half, but because I still think it was pretty well made, even though it's got that 90s cliche and everything else. It still it had bad writing. You're you're right on you're right on point on that. But there was also some entertaining parts of it with the writing and stuff like that. I thought the characters were pretty good. I think I think like we talked in our midway episode, I feel like this would be good as a mini series too, to do a mini series mm -hmm. on the uh, uh, not just the Memphis Bell, but just that whole you know the, the whole battle over Europe and everything else with the uh, um, the bombers. But um, you you do get some good input and everything else. But yeah, the 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 special effects are pretty tame. You, you could tell it's 90 oh, yeah. special effects. I mean, yeah. they're, you, especially the one scene that just kills me. I, I know it's sad because you see a, you see a, a guy falling out of his plane, but you, you could tell that's like a plastic. It, 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 it's just a guy with his hands up and it doesn't look right at all. And you know, there's some other scene scenes up He's there. To go splat. Yeah. It, it's just, there was just a little bit of special effects that weren't good, but I mean, I don't think this was a higher budget film that they made. I think this was more for like an entertainment value, just during a whole world war two time of our history. But critically it's, 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 it's a mediocre when it comes to how they made this movie. So, um, but I, like I said, I would still give this a four for enjoyment. I, I still think it is a fun, not, not fun, but like entertaining. It's an entertaining world war two flick. Um, it's well, not real quick. Would you change your rating if you weren't watching it now? Like if you didn't have the nostalgia attached yeah. to it? If you saw it, like, all right. So, That's a good question. So if we watched this movie when it first came out, right? Yeah. Would your rating still be the same? You know what? No. I, and I think that actually Stu's brought that up many times. That's why we came with the whole rating system. So that's why I changed my critical. But enjoyment probably still yes because i like classic movies yeah. i like older movies so my enjoyment would still be the same but my critical e, e, probably would be probably i don't know now that's that's a hard fucking question now but it, it's a good question because i do go to set a nostalgic point that's but that's why i dropped my critical because originally my critical was gonna be a little bit higher yeah. I, I was gonna go for like a three and a half so yeah you're 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 on point there if if i watched it now would it be different but I, like I said, I'm a big fan of classic movies and giving movies a chance, trying movies. Like I got even movies from the 60s and 70s and 50s about World War II and stuff like that. There's a lot of good ones out there. Patton and, you know, uh, the 80s, uh, uh, Platoon and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Born on Fourth of July and, you know, uh, movies like that. But uh, it's, you know, it's, it's got its, it's, got a hit, its hits, or, hits or misses, basically. So we're going to go ahead and end our show here. I'd like to uh, say the names in remembrance of the Memphis bell crew. And like I said, there's 10, 10 uh, people there uh, that are on these uh, uh, flying fortresses, but there was actually more because through different missions, it changed back and forth. So I'm going to uh, read their names here. We have Bob Morgan as the pilot. We have Jim Verini's as the co-pilot. We have Bob Hansen as the radio operator, Cecil Scott, ball turret gunner, Vince Evans, bombardier, J.P. Quinlan, tail gunner. Bill Winchell, waist gunner. Scott Miller, waist gunner. Joe Gibron, crew chief. Levi Dillon, top turret gunner. Eugene Atkins, top turret gunner. Harold Locke, waist gunner. Charles B. Layton, the navigator. Kazmer A. Tony, nastal, waist gunner. And then we also have the mascot, Stuka, the Scottish Terrier which was actually a mascot for the plane. And in the movie... Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, they, they had a mascot for the plane. And in the movie, you, you had the dog, Henry... Uh, 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 Tate Donovan's dog, where uh, uh, Henry Connick Jr. said, I want yeah. the dog because he wants to have a chance. That is actually one scene we never talked about that I actually want to bring up, the whole uh, tail gunner scene and how Tate Donovan, the co-pilot, yeah. really wanted to have the chance to shoot down a plane. And he fucked that up. Yeah. What, what did you all think of that scene, by the way? I think that uh, the co-pilot should have fucking stayed in his place and yeah. not go back to where shit is actually happening. Because he was He's arguing, trained. he was arguing with Captain Dennis all the time on how he was doing things. And then right after he did that, and then he goes right back up and, uh, d d Captain Dennis tells him to uh, do something. He says, you do whatever you're doing. You, you know what you're doing. Like he completely got quiet because he, that, uh, he shot that plane down and it went right through the B 17 and it just cut in half. And you know, a whole crew was uh, uh, lost after that. So what did you all think of Tate Donovan in that scene? Part of me wants to completely agree with Ragnar that he he, he wasn't trained for that, but also it would it's very hard to predict how uh, a, a damaged aircraft 
uh, the, the path it's going to take on its way down. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. Can't, yeah, you can't, yeah. You can't so figure that out. Whether it was him who did it or it was the assigned gunner who did it, you can't say for sure the the same outcome wouldn't have happened. Yeah, uh, he he was successful in taking down the bird. With uh, he did not shoot its own his own tail, which is I always expect. That's what I thought was yeah. going to happen. I was expecting him to shoot his own tail. I wasn't expecting uh, what ended up happening. Um, so he did that. He just couldn't predict the way that bird was going to come down. Yeah. Um, which led to horribleness. And then you saw that he, he carried that weight on him um, a- after his whole demeanor changed. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and end this show. Um, the one thing that we also have to remember, over 50,000 U.S. Airmen died during World War II. And we want to remember them all for their service and their sacrifice. Thank you. We also want to honor all of our military. Army. Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Uh, you forgot one. Oh, sh- yeah. You, you got to. You got to include our, our newest baby brother, you know, Space Force. Space Force. You have yeah. to. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Not <laughs> without the Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. Yeah. These are our future war fighters. Yeah. Uh, got got against, against the aliens. Yeah. Aliens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I mean, it, it's weird as shit to say. I will absolutely it's, be the first But it one is a branch that. of our military. But it is a branch. It is. And just like the, it's weird, but just like the Marines, you know, <laughs> we, we give them their own distinction, you know, they are Department of the Navy. Yep. You got to do the same thing for the Space Force. Right. It's fucking weird, but it's true. Yeah, but you're completely right. So we need to remember it on our Memorial Day. Thank you for fighting to keep us free and for your service. Seriously, to yeah, to from the you. bottom of all of our hearts, guys. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for our for your service. Um, and then finally, we dedicate this War's Hell series to all of you men and women. And I appreciate everybody for listening to these series. We 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 loved doing them. They, if you felt like they needed to be done, to exactly you know, I mean, we talk about movies, but. To, go basically on a little history lesson about yeah. you know what happened during world war ii and i think all these episodes kind of show that in a way and uh i think it was a it was a good series to do for us and uh to dedicate basically to our military to all the servicemen all the men and women that have lost their lives during all the world wars that we've had and wars all together and uh events in our history so i'm gonna say uh sign off right here guys and uh see y'all later thank you bye thank you Hey guys, this is Ron. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Barrel Age Flicks. 2022 has been an amazing year with our great shows, including BAF, The Small Batch, Sammy Select, and The Tasting Room. If you like our show, please leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Guys, this helps out enormously. Give us a follow on Instagram at Barrel Age Flicks Podcast. If you would like to send us a special film request, please contact us via Instagram, and we will give you a personal shout-out on the show. We are also on Facebook and Twitter. Our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor, Audible, Pocket Cast, Spotify, CastBox, iHeartRadio, and Pandora. Special thanks to Carl Casey at White Bat Audio on YouTube for his awesome music. This guy fucking rocks. Check him out. want to give a shout out to Sammy, one of our guest hosts on the show who does our amazing album artwork. Thank you, Sammy. Our podcast only exists because of listeners like you. To find other great shows, head over to The Den. Show. Hope you join us for our next episode. Later, guys. Hey, everybody. Y'all should check out the podcast of the month at the den. Show. The show is called Organic Spaceship, a great podcast where Josh, the host, sits down with people to drink whiskey and talk about their lives. True stories, just average guys that love to talk. And drinking whiskey, that's the best thing in the world. Seriously, guys, check them out.